Okay, welcome back again to my talk about uh, zero knowledge and SNARKs. Um, in this part, I'm going to explain to you the concept of zero knowledge, the traditional concept of true zero knowledge. Uh, there are various strategies to explain zero knowledge to people, but the one I like best is through authentication, because this is something that most people already know. So imagine here, by the way, so now the, the, the prover is a client and the verifier is a server. And what we want, we want authentication. So the client need to authenticate himself towards the, the server. We assume that client and server already agree on some key K and well, what we don't want, of course, well, we don't want a password or a key to go over the network. So how do we avoid this? Well, we use challenge and response protocols. So what the, the verifier says is, well, I'm going to send you a challenge, C, and I want you to encrypt it using the, the, the key K. So the, the verifier, the, the server sends a challenge C, the client encrypts computing R, which is a response, sends R, and the verifier checks whether this is correct, or you can encrypt or decrypt, in this case it doesn't matter, um, and it will check whether the answer is correct. So this is interesting because we are having sort of a, a proof of knowledge, right? Um, a proof of the knowledge K, while K is not being sent over the network. So this is basic challenge response using symmetric crypto. You can do a similar thing with a hash function, and you can also do it with public key cryptography. In this case, we have a private key, which is a hat, and we have uh, a public key. Um, <laughs> well, that's interesting, uh, because now, um, what happens is that the verifier will will send a, a, a challenge C and is sort of asking the prover, um, please sign this. Please sign this using your private key. So the prover signs it and the verifier uses the public key to verify that the answer is, is correct. And um, so this is a, a good protocol. In fact, this is how um, HTTPS, um, this is the, the, the way that your browser authenticates a site certificate. So uh, notice that in this case, we have the client and the server again on the opposite side, right? Because it's the verifier now is the browser on the right, and the prover will be the, the server, which will um, probably has like a, a, a hardware security module which will do this the signature. Okay, so it's important in this lecture that um, I always keep the prover and the verifier on the left and on the right, but sometimes the role change. So so please be uh, alert to to this fact. Um, now what's interesting is that we can in, we can. Um, expand this idea of proving knowledge for more useful things. So here I have, uh, I'm going to give you a protocol for um, showing knowledge of a discrete log. So what's a discrete log? Well, essentially you, you choose a prime number P and you choose some um, number alpha, which is much of high order, so it could be a generator of the group, and then if, if you choose x at random and you compute alpha to the power x, which gives you beta, right? Then the fact is the following, then x is called the discrete logarithm of beta, right? And it turns out that this is a difficult problem. Um, if, if you do this, if, if you choose x at random, very large number, um, and the prime is, is large too, and you give 
alpha, beta, and p to somebody, he probably won't be able to um, to compute x from these results. So this is this is called the discrete log problem, which is very useful in cryptography, used in many places, including it's the basis of the Algamal uh, encryption scheme, also the basis of many signature schemes. Um, now I'm going to show you here a protocol for a proof of knowledge. Um, so the prover is showing that he knows a discrete logarithm x for this equation. So given alpha, beta, and p, okay, which are sent in this initializing step. So um, what's the protocol? Well, the protocol is depicted here. The prover will choose another number, another exponent y, and will compute gamma, which is defined as alpha to the power y modulo p, and send gamma to, to the verifier. Now the verifier will flip a coin, 0, 1, and depending on the outcome, the prover can give two different responses. If the coin flip is 0, then the response will be the y, the value the exponent used in this computation. If the coin flip is 1, then the value will be x plus y. So y is this random number and x is the, here the secret. And then um, the verifier is able to, to do the check. If, um, if the coin is 0, if the challenge is 0, then essentially um, the verifier will check that gamma has been corrected, uh, has been computed correctly. If the the challenge is one, then it sort of combines it combines um, gamma together with beta, and therefore the verifier can check that when combines um, x and y, that the answer is correct. Okay, so this is the protocol. So let's now try to reason about this protocol. Um, so we go through the, the, the three steps. There's no succinctness in this case, so we're not worried about succinctness in this whole uh, section. Um, so we want completeness. If both parties are honest, the protocol gives the correct result. Well, if P can answer both challenges, then it means that the prover must know X because um, it knows Y and it knows X plus Y modulo P minus one. So it can compute the difference, which is X. About soundness, how is soundness in this context? Well, if the prover is trying to cheat, then um, if the proof is trying, the proof is trying to cheat, it doesn't know X, she can answer only one of the two challenges. So she will be caught in each round with probability 50%. And by repeating the protocol K times, she gets caught with a probability uh, overwhelmingly close to one. So this, um, the soundness condition is also verified, satisfied. What about privacy? So why is this protocol private. I'm not going to show you formal definition of zero knowledge. I'm just going to give you the intuition. What What's leaking in this protocol oops, um, is the following. If, if C is equal to zero, then what the verifier learns is Y, but Y is just a random number. So that cannot convey any useful information. And if C is equal to 1, then the verifier gets no X plus Y, X plus Y modulo P minus 1. But supposing that Y has been chosen uniformly random from the group P minus 1, then it means that the sum X plus Y is also completely randomized. So that also does not convey any useful information. Okay, so it's a bit uh, high level intuition of why this um, this protocol is private and, and could be argued zero knowledge. Now I'm going to present you a second protocol, but for that I'm going to 
indeed uh, a basic uh, primitive which is called bit commitment. A bit commitment is um, consists of two phases, which is a commit step and an open step. So a bit commitment, we we have a bit b, and we are going to actually what we're going to to do, we're going to put it in a box, or we're going to put it the bit, we're going to put it in an envelope, and we put this envelope on the table such that the sender can see it and the receiver can see it, and at the later phase which may or may not happen, and many protocols, um, there are, are commitments which will not be opened. Uh, at the later phase, optionally, um, the envelope which is lies on the table will be opened and um, the receiver can see whether the bit that was written, that was hidden inside the envelope is zero or, or is one. So what what is the important aspect of of a bit commitment. Well, I mentioned already the the commitment should be be private, should be hiding, meaning that the receiver isn't able to see what the bits committed to are. But on the other hand, the sender should be should be committed. The commitment should be binding, meaning that the sender, once he commits to a zero, he cannot change his mind suddenly and and, and, and flip it to a one or the other way around. So this is why it's called a commitment. Now this is a very useful uh, primitive, as we will see in the next slide, um, because I'm going to give you a proof, zero knowledge proof for a Hamiltonian cycle. The proof says the following: um, What's a Hamiltonian cycle? By the way, a Hamiltonian cycle is a path through a graph that will will go to every every vertex of the graph and will return at at its origin and um i want you to know that hamiltonian cycle is mp complete so if um if your graph is big this is a very child example but if your graph is big i don't know 400 uh, vertices or something then um there are instances in which the Given, given um, an incidence matrix, it's impossible to determine if the graph has a Hamiltonian cycle. Um, so this is the incidence matrix, which shows, for instance, that uh, vertex 1 is connected to vertex 2 and to vertex 3 and to vertex 4, but not to vertex 1 as 1 itself, does make too much sense, uh, 5 or 6. So. How does this work? Well, we're going to do the following. The prover will apply a random permutation on the set of vertices. I, I use this example, so very small. The, the permutation is called sigma. Um, and so we are going to apply this permutation. This will give us an isomorphic graph H. Um, and then so we get an incidence matrix of H and we can commit to each entry of the incidence matrix H which will result in the commitment to H which is depicted in, in this picture. So this is the first the first step. Now the second step is that the, the verifier is going to flip a coin, zero or one, and now depending on the outcome there are two possibilities. If C is equal to zero, then um, what happens is that the the commitment, this commitment here, will be completely opened, and the 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 verifier can verify that the the graph H is a faithful copy of graph G. So, so this is uh, the, the one option. It shows essentially that H was a faithful copy of, of G. When C is equal to one, when the challenge bit is one, in that case, um, we show that the permuted version of G has a Hamiltonian cycle. So it's only going to open those 
uh, positions, well, one in each column and one in each row, which will show that H has a Hamiltonian cycle, exactly the way it's depicted in this graph. Um, and so this is, this is our protocol for uh, Hamiltonian cycle. I will leave this an exercise for you to check the completeness, the soundness, and the privacy of this protocol. Um, and I just want to outline to you the, the common structure that we saw in these two protocols. We saw in step one a sort of a commitment to an alternative instance. We saw this in the example of uh, discrete log when, when we sent uh, uh, produced alpha to the, to the y and, and uh, producing gamma. Or we, we saw the pre-booted version h of the original g in the last uh, instance. The challenge, again, is this case is simply 0 or 1. And then we, the prover in, in the last step either shows that the alternative instance, the alternative world, is a faithful representation of the original, or uh, when the challenge is 1, it shows that the alternative instance has the desired property that needed to be proven. So this is a very general structure of first generation of observer knowledge proofs. Um, I just want to close this part talking about Alibaba and the cave. If you are familiar with that, you can see sort of the resemblance with the prover. Um, we can generalize the idea of the Hamiltonian uh, cycle and, and bit commitments. We can use this for Boolean commitment, show that a Boolean commitment is satisfiable. There's also been in the literature examples of zero knowledge using Sudoku, which follow slightly the same uh, idea. The problem with Sudoku is that to show that the alternative instance is, is really faithful actually is, is more elaborate, which is the reason why I I, I do not prefer to use that as an example.